Welcome, in, welcome to Early Steps Next Steps Seminar number one. The focus of these seminars is to um, provide a, a theoretical background, a, a conceptual framework, if you will, for the work that you're doing in your practica, whether it's early steps or next steps. We really feel um, that the hands-on aspect of a clinical practicum is absolutely critical to folks learning how to work with really any reader, but in particular struggling readers. At the same time, the, it's easy to get lost in the nuts and bolts of the, the uh, intervention models themselves, what to do when, and each little nuance. And so the goal of these seminars is to sort of step back from the nuts and bolts and to provide you with a, a theoretical framework, a, a conceptual overview of why we choose these particular instructional vehicles, why the pacing is the way it is, why move from one thing, for example, why move from rhyming short vowels to mix non-rhyming short vowels and then finally to vowel, vowel patterns. You know, what, what is it about the careful um, uh, difficulty leveling of the text that, that particularly helps struggling readers? So those kinds of issues we're going to be exploring in these five seminars that you'll be attending. And so without further ado, let's talk to the site coordinators. Uh, each time I'm going to show you this slide and I'm going to ask you to complete the following information and to fax that information to our wonderful Nikki Fellows at the clinic. All this information is important. Uh, please note that your attendance at all five seminars is required regardless of whether you're going for just your certification or whether you're going for that as well as your university credit. So just to be clear about it, everyone who wants to certify in Early Steps and Next Steps needs to attend all five of these seminars. And since they're on video, that shouldn't be too arduous. Okay, let's get started. Since about the 1960s, up until the 1960s, there was very little research done in education in general, frankly, and in reading as well. People did sort of goofy little ad hoc studies, but not, with a, not, not with, driven by the scientific method. But in the early 60s, people started trying to apply the scientific method of having a hypothesis, testing it empirically, trying to rule out alternative explanations. They tried to bring that to the study of reading. One of the first things that the researchers were very, very interested in was seeing, trying to determine what kind of what kind of abilities seem to indicate whether or not a child who entered first grade would exit first grade uh, reading on grade level or not? Because certainly by now people had picked up on the fact that not everyone came out of first grade reading well. And so they wanted to know why. And in particular, are there certain abilities that kids even walk into first grade having? Um, and if they have those abilities, they end up being successful readers. If they don't have those abilities, they end up being not, not as successful. The idea behind it was if we can figure out, if we can identify or target particular abilities entering first grade, and we know those abilities are the ones that predict reading success at the end of first grade, then we can really work on that all year and in that sense bring everybody up to speed. So in the mid-60s, uh, the, the Office of Education at the time, there was no department, uh, funded a large group of studies that, were, that, were, that took place all across the nation, in fact, headed by um, Bond and Dykstra from the University of Minnesota. They were called the first grade studies. And the goal there was to collect data on thousands of entering first graders at the beginning of the year, everything you can possibly think of, and then collect reading data, achievement data, on them at the end of the year and run regression analyses to try and figure out which of those factors, whether it was short-term memory or vocabulary or um, auditory discrimination or visual, visual discrimination, which of the factors, um, which of the abilities they assessed at the beginning of the year would predict first grade uh, success at the end. Okay, and here are some of the, the factors that people at the time really suspected these abilities, these factors, might be strong predictors. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to sit and think for a minute and I'd like you to pick the top, what you think came out in study after study after study as the top three predictors of first grade reading success. Once you've picked your top three, then I want you to rank them in order with one being the strongest, two, and three. Site coordinators, please pause the tape. And welcome back. So let's talk about these. What I'm going to uh, 
tell you about is which came, which didn't come out first, okay? Health, not highly correlated with reading achievement at the end of first grade. IQ, a lot of people were surprised by this because they expected that it would be. But interestingly enough, IQ is not highly correlated with reading achievement in the early grades. It does become more strongly correlated later on when the nature of the test change and they're testing more, you know, uh, deeper levels of comprehension and vocabulary. But initially, and particularly for first grade, very weak correlate with reading achievement. Okay, oral language ability. Now before you faint, let me tell you that oral language ability uh, came out about fourth, tends to come out about fourth in these studies as being a strong predictor of reading achievement at the end of first grade. So it is a, it is a factor, but it's not in the top three. Socioeconomic status, poverty, actually not a very strong correlate in comparison to other things. So there are other things that are stronger predictors of reading achievement. Gender, eh. print a oops, amount of time parents read to a child. The way they factored, the way they look, defined this particular factor was sheer amount of time, not what was going on when parents read to the child. And I think if they had looked at that, this might have come out higher, but it's down the list. It's not within the top three. Okay, so within the top three, we have knowledge of letter names, phonemic awareness, and print awareness. Consistently, the third strongest predictor is print awareness. Print awareness just means how books work. Knowing, the child knowing that, uh, for example, directionality. Hand them a book and they know they go uh, front to back, left to right on the page, top to bottom. What's a, what's a word, what's a letter, what's a sentence, what's a page, all those kinds of things that we take for granted. That was the third strongest predictor. In other words, knowing how books work was the third strongest predictor of reading achievement. Now, phonemic awareness and knowledge of letter names, depending on how the tasks were arranged, varied whether which one was first and which one was second. However, as the tasks became more sophisticated and more finely tuned, you'll find that phonemic Phonemic awareness tends to be overall the top predictor of reading achievement. Knowledge of letter names, second. So in your, the order you should have would be first, phonemic awareness, knowledge of letter names, second, and print awareness, third. Okay, what is the, now there were other things that people suspected at the time could ha impact reading achievement. And I just want to go over these quickly and uh, blow big holes in them, okay? The idea of people having modality preferences and learning styles, like someone's a visual learner, someone's a global learner, someone's an auditory learner. This has been invest, this is a, this belief that people are different kinds of learners, that their brains work differently, like I'm more visual and she's more auditory and he's more global, has been investigated for decades. There is absolutely no data, there are no data to suggest that there's any relationship between people's perceived notions of their modalities and their reading achievement. Zero, zip. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I won't go into them here, but primarily it's that if you look at, you have to look at the nature of the task that the person's being asked to do. Reading is a visually oriented task. Certain other tasks have more physical, uh, physical nature to them. And so in that sense, um, certain modalities may lend themselves to certain tasks, but it's not that people's brains work differently, okay? Perceptual skills, the ability to look at certain things and know whether you, for example, you'd have a whole line of birds and you have to pick out which bird doesn't have a, the wing. Not correlated with reading achievement. Motor skills, there was a, a hypothesis at one point that children who didn't learn to do certain physical things like crawl or march correctly, that that split their hemispheres somehow and that they needed to resolve that issue physically and then they would read better. No relationship to reading achievement. Mental age IQ, we've already talked about that. Uh, for a long time the notion was if we teach children to learn <clears throat> to read prior to a mental age of 7.6, it will hurt them. Wrong. Logical and analytical abilities. Um, some science researchers speculated that perhaps in order to learn those things, remember the three we talked about? Phonemic awareness, letter name, and print awareness, perhaps in order to develop those abilities, you needed to have certain logical and analytic analytical abilities. For example, knowing that if I, you know, uh, tip this here, what's going to happen? If then kinds of thinking, that if those were in place prior, that would facilitate kids learning those important foundational skills, which would then in turn facilitate reading achievement. And so the hypothesis was 
that you need to do logical and analytical ability work first, then skill development, then reading. And actually what they found was that doing these sort of logical thinking type tasks along with the skills of alphabet, phonological awareness, learning how books work, that actually these things feed on each other in a very nice fashion and you don't need to wait until certain levels are in place before you start doing skill development. Home literacy experience, experiences. If you ask yourself, if you say to yourself, okay, the abilities that seem to predispose children to reading success at the end of first grade are things like knowing their letter names, being phonologically aware, knowing how books work. You gotta ask yourself, where do children learn those things often? Okay, where do children have an opportunity to learn those things? And so in that sense, this can be a key factor in laying that foundation or not laying that foundation. Uh, Bill Thiel did a study in San Diego in the early 80s, and there have been many, many studies, frankly, done since. Uh, Shirley Bryce Heath's Way with Words, et cetera, et cetera, looking at literacy events in the home. Everything from reading out loud to a child to if a child is sitting down and asks things like, Mommy, how do you spell such and such, okay? And he logged those events, and he was very liberal in what he cast as a literacy event in the home. Even uh, parents developing a grocery list was cast as a literacy event, okay? <clears throat> they, he found the variance, or the variability amongst homes was so wide that he, uh, when he extrapolated the data out, he estimated that some children received as few as 23 hours of literacy experience prior to going to first grade, as opposed to other children receiving close to 2,000 hours of, of literacy experience. And if you think about the impact that that has on developing those foundational skills, you'll see that this is a, is a very, uh, it's a big, a big source of influence. All right, so if we know that to come out of first grade reading on level, you need to have knowledge of letter names, I would add, and sounds, be phono phonologically aware at the phonemic level, and you need to know how books work, that has implications for kindergarten instruction, correct? And we know that kin uh, kindergarten instruction, in particular whether <coughs> educators work on teaching kids to read or even doing the foundational skills, has been an extremely controversial topic. You have folks who say, absolutely not, kindergarten is not the place to learn to read, it's for different things, it's for social development, et cetera. Okay, so there's been a lot of contention on this. So let's look at the data. Okay, one of the, one of the positions that's, that's held sway um, in our society for a long time is the maturation position. The maturation position says that reading instruction in kindergarten is developmentally inappropriate. It's kind of the mental age argument. The notion is they are just, most kids just aren't ready. They haven't matured enough. And so the instruction will be confusing and boring. It's gonna turn them off. And, and uh, burn them out, okay? So that's one of the positions. It's just wrong because they're not ready. Then there's the reading is natural position. This kind of is one of the whole, late, whole language tenets. The notion here is that reading instruction in kindergarten just isn't necessary. In fact, instruction as a rule in reading isn't necessary. If we immerse children in literacy-rich, meaningful experiences of reading and writing, they will learn. So here you get the notion of you don't really want to talk about letters and sounds deliberately, but you can immerse them in print, for example, by, by labeling everything in the room, and that will help them learn to read. I've got an idea. Let's look at the research, because those two prior positions are not supported by the research at all. In fact, the research suggests that reading instruction in kindergarten, in fact, has a positive effect on students' achievement and attitude toward reading. There's a fabulous study that was uh, published in 1995 by Hansen and Farrell in Reading Research Quarterly where they traced a very large group of kids, uh, about 1,500 kids or so. The only, thing, uh, the only thing different in these, the main difference in these children's school experience was half the group got in reading instruction in kindergarten. 30 minutes a day, not fancy. It looked a lot like um, SRA Reading Mastery, if you're, if you're familiar with that. The other group did not get that. Other than that, they had the same kindergarten experience. Tracked these kids all the way to 12th grade. Took measures on them all along the way. Every possible measure you can think of, both cognitive and sort of af affective attitudinal measures. 
And what they found was at the end of 12th grade, the students who had received reading instruction in kindergarten, 30 minutes a day, nothing fancy, outperformed their peers who hadn't significantly on practically all measures, not just cognitive measures of reading achievement, but in addition measures of um, amount of time spent leisure reading, graduation rates, attendance rates, etc. Um, and these differences cut across race, class, gender, and geographic lines. If you think about that, that's powerful. So in fact, when you hear people say, kids shouldn't learn to read in kindergarten, blah, 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 what you can respond with is this. There is not a shred of empirical evidence that suggests learning to read in kindergarten is harmful in any way, cogn cognitively or affectively. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean we're talking about academic boot camps where we put kids in rows and we tell them, sit down, you haven't finished making that row of H's, you can't go to recess. We're not talking about that kind of situation. But we're talking about, the data suggests that kind of just regular, not so great reading instruction has an effect. Can you imagine what Hanson and Farrell would have found if they'd done really cool, motivating, excellent reading instruction? The effects might have been even stronger. Couple this fact that in fact reading instruction in kindergarten is positive with the fact that we know from many, many, many studies that the probability of kids who exit grade one reading below level, staying poor readers unless they get some kind of significant help is 0.88. And this, this study has been replicated many times. So when we think, oh, he'll just catch on, the data do not support that contention. In fact, the data support the notion that he won't catch on and that he's likely to stay a poor reader for the duration of his school career. So if you couple what we know about reading instruction in kindergarten, what we know about kids who exit first grade not on level, and I'm going to suggest, uh, similar to Marilyn Adams in her 1990 book, Beginning to Read, Learning to, Learn, Beginning to Read, uh, Learning to Read, Thinking, ah, uh, that book. <laughs> I'll hold it up afterward. Beginning to read, thinking and learning about print. There you go. I'm going to suggest that for these kids in particular, kids who come in behind the eight ball, the kids who come in with 23 hours of literacy experience total in their lives, that for those kids, there's not an instructional moment to waste, even and especially in kindergarten. Let's step back from sort of general research, general, general research on instruction, let's go back and talk about those top three predictors. And I'm going to talk about the one that seems to garner the most variance, particularly in studies in the last 20, well, 15 years or so. And it's called uh, phonemic awareness, okay? Phonemic awareness, don't confuse it with phonics, okay? It's related to but not the same as. Okay, phonemic awareness falls under the larger umbrella term of phonological. Phonemic awareness is a type of phonological awareness. So phonological awareness is the umbrella term, and phonemic awareness is a term that falls underneath. And it relates to the size of the unit of speech you're thinking of, OK? Phonemic awareness is the ability to think about, attend to, and then manipulate the smallest sounds in speech. For example, OK, and you know the slashes mean sound. So this would be what? And this would be? Eh. And this would be, okay, so even though this particular, this has two graphemes, it only makes one sound. It's only one phoneme, okay? Now this is different than, for example, other sounds we're hearing like, <coughs> ah! well, that's speech. That is speech, kind of. It's not a speech sound. It's just a, a verbal sound. But anyway, these kind of Sounds that you hear are not phonemes. You, they, they fall under the category auditory because you can hear them and they're sound, but they are not phonemes. Phonemes are speech sounds, okay, related to language. Now, this particular ability, messing around with like and and i and b, whatever those sounds are, the ability to mess around with those, in particular, the ability to take a word like, let's say, rug, repeat. And, to, and, now, and now segment it out, er, uh, g. The ability to do that, to take a word and chop it up, to segment the little sounds, tells us more about whether or not a child will succeed as a first grade reader than any of the other abilities we've talked about. Just that ability. And notice, when we do, let's do that again. 
uh, let's do another one. Let's say um, mop. Repeat. Mop. Segmented. M -a -p. Did we do any reading there? Did we mess with any letters? No letters. No reading. No words on text. In text, that was purely sound. We were messing with sounds, and we were taking a unit of speech, a word, and segmenting the word up into its smallest constituent parts, phonemes. That ability is the strongest predictor of reading achievement. Okay. What's really interesting is that even middle class kids often don't develop this ability during first grade, about approximately a third. Another thing that's very important to realize is that about 20 years of research have now finally concluded that problems doing that, problems messing around with speech sounds, form the core deficit in dyslexia. Dyslexia is defined as um, a, a disability that's neurobiological in origin, particularly identified by difficulty learning to read words accurately and fluently, and even spelling, okay? And later manifests itself in difficulties in reading comprehension, even because the rate of reading is so slow, okay? So severe reading difficulties have been traced to phonological difficulties, not being able to chop up sounds, not being able to blend sounds. couple of just phrases that you're going to want to have in, or terms that you're going to want to have in your, in your background knowledge. When you're talking about phonology, you're talking about the rules of how speech sounds work together. The phonology in English is different than the phonology in Spanish, which is different than the phonology in Swahili, which is different than phonology in Japanese. For example, in Spanish, you will find, um, uh, when you look at the L or the R, those, or, or the enye, those kinds of sounds we don't particularly have in English. And we have similar sounds, but they're not exactly the same. In Swahili, you'll find sounds together that we don't use in English, like you would find mb at the beginning of a word, mbuzi, which is goat. We don't have that in English. Ngombe, ng, together at the beginning of the word. We don't have that in English, but in Swahili, ngombe is uh, cow. Okay, so the phonology differs across languages. Phoneme, I've already talked about, it's the smallest sounds in speech. Depending on which linguist you talk to, there are approximately 40 to 44 phonemes in spoken English. Now, we only have 26 graphemes, but if you think about that, remember that the TH is a phoneme on its own, but it's made up of two graphemes that on their own make completely different sounds. So there are more sounds than there are graphemes so then there are single graphemes. Okay. So we've got phonology, the way the sounds work together in speech, orthography, that's the way the sounds are, oh, that's the way, the, that's the writing system of a language. In an alphabetic system where letters represent sound, it relates to the spelling patterns that combine in various ways to form different words. So whenever you think, Phonology, think how the sounds go together. Whenever you hear the word orthography, think how it's spelled. Okay? And when you think about phonological awareness in general, and again, remember, that's the umbrella term. Phonological awareness is the ability to attend to, penetrate, mess with, manipulate, focus on different aspects of the sounds in speech. Phonemic awareness is a little, t it's at the smallest level of sounds. Well, if phonemic awareness is at the smallest level of sounds, tiny, tiny, the tiniest sounds you can get, then there is, must be other bigger levels of phonological awareness, and there are. I'm going to go back to that. The easiest level includes things like rhyming, just knowing which things rhyme. Playing around with syllables. Even preschoolers can play around with syllables. If you, for example, uh, let's, let's clap these words out together. I'll say a word, then you repeat it, and then we'll clap them out, okay? So playground. 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 So you heard the two beats there, right? Let's try another one. Hop. 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 So just one beat. Calliope. Calliope. Okay, four beats, I think. Okay. Even preschoolers who don't know any alphabet 
can do those tasks, those syllables, they have that awareness of clapping, they can hear the beats in syllables, okay, okay. they can do rhymes, okay, um, that's, is that at the phoneme level? Turn to somebody near you and speculate, turn off the tape, is that at the phoneme level? Welcome back. No, it's not at the phoneme level, okay? Phoneme level, like, like take for example the word hop, hop, okay? To get to the phoneme level, what would you have to do? Hop. There's three phonemes, okay? So if we're just talking about syllable beats, calliope, four beats, but it's got a lot, a lot more phonemes. So you see, we're at a gross level of phonological awareness here. Okay, so the key point about this is at these big gross levels, hearing syllables and rhymes, even preschoolers can do this, and it's a good thing to do for them. However, if you want to get closer and closer to that phoneme level, something has to happen to trigger that, or at least something seems to help trigger that. That something is learning your letter names, and it's probably the idea of messing with T, B, R, and, and sort of getting kids to, f and they're also usually trying to spell a little bit, getting kids to focus on the fact that, oh, there's a beginning to the word, okay? Working on alphabet, alphabet work seems to be necessary in order to sink below these big levels of phonological awareness down toward the phoneme level. So let's go back and talk about this before we go down to the other levels of phonological awareness. Why do some kids seem to have such difficulty becoming phonemically aware? Okay, well, let's think about it. Kids don't think about things like hop has three phonemes. This is completely irre irre irrelevant to them. Kids process language for what it means. Okay, and so it's, phonemes are just sounds. It's not terribly interesting unless you're, you find one of those kids that just loves messing with language. Okay. The other point is phonemes can't truly be isolated. If you took the word cat and you put it on a tape and you slowed it down as, on a particular tape to, see, to get it as slow as it could get, and so it sounds something like cat, okay. you're never going to get to cat. It's an artificial, arbitrary skill and convention that we've learned because of our alphabetic language, but it's not innate to the language getting down to the phoneme level. It, and, and, and it can be harder than it looks to try that because individuals differ in their ability in all kinds of tasks. Some folks are fabulous piano players and hardly need any instruction. Other folks, tone deaf and clunky on the keys. And then there's the great unwashed middle where they're just pretty regular at the piano, okay? Phonological awareness is the same way. So, and if you think about your own, perhaps, children or people that you know or you and your siblings, some folks have a real facility for language in terms of playing with it and messing with the little nuances. Other folks, and then there's this great lump of all of us in the middle who are, there, we're okay at it. But then there are some folks down at this end of the distribution for whom it is very difficult. When you say something to them like, I'm gonna uh, say a word, I want you to say it, and then you want to, I want you to tell me the first sound. Ready? Hop. Say. I say the word, you say the word, and then tell me the first sound. Hop. Hop. Okay. For some individuals, that is very, very difficult to do. And for others, it's just a no-brainer. So there's individual variation. There are individual differences here. And the research on dyslexia shows that difficulty in this area is often has a genetic source. Okay. It is familial in the sense that difficulty in this area is passed down. In, through generations. Kids who have difficulties with doing things like we just did, pulling the first sound off a word, if you could take them right from learning their alphabet right into blending phonics, very, very difficult. Very difficult. So kids who are phonemically low, who don't have phonological awareness training, in particular phonemic awareness training, often have difficulty benefiting from even very good phonics instruction because they can't get down to mess, they can't penetrate the word to get into the little sounds. Okay, so then we have the easiest levels of phonological awareness. There are some mid-levels. Okay, and I'm going to show you 
one of the levels that we work with in early steps all the time. Michelle, could you come on up and give me a hand? Thank you. We usually do this in early steps with uh, letters, but I want to be purely phonological today. So we're going to mess with these just with pictures, which is certainly something you could do. For example, if you were working with children uh, who weren't real clear on their letters, you could start this way. Okay, would you point to each one, Michelle, and tell me what they are? Fork, lock, tire. Okay, what's that? Fence. Now, would we put it with fork, fence, lock, fence, or tire, fence? Okay, touch and say. Fork, fence. Okay. What's, what's that? Leaf. Okay, where does that one go? Lock, leaf. Very good. And what's that? Lamp. Okay. Lock, leaf, lamp. Okay. Thanks. Great. You get the idea. The task is, and you know from picture sorts, the task is what is that first sound and match it up, okay? That's the very easiest level of phoneme awareness, okay? And picture sorts help develop that. Let's talk a little bit about the more advanced levels. And this is where you really start to get in close to, to reading, okay? Uh, blending phonemes. For example, if I say to you, b, what, what word am I saying? B, a, t. What's the word? Yes. And if I say, er, a, uh, g, what's the word? Yes. If you think about it, you took er, a, uh, g. You weren't reading anything. You took the sounds and you mushed them together. You blended them together. When you're talking about the most advanced levels of phonological awareness, these are two of the more advanced levels. Uh, I want to talk about this one here because this one, as I mentioned earlier, this one does garner the most variance in the studies. In particular, being able to take words and chop them up into the little sounds to segment the sounds is the number one predictor. So let's think about how that happens in early steps. Uh, probably the place you'll see it the most and the best is in when the student writes their sentence. Okay, so let's, let's just, let me just remind you about this a little bit and think about what's happening here and think about what the beginning reader is doing. Let's take a sentence like, I like recess. Repeat. I like recess. One more time. I like recess. So Michelle, come on up here. Okay, go ahead. They can write the first word right away, right? Okay, read in point. What's next? I like. Say like. Like. Say like. Like. What's the first sound you're hearing? Oh, oh. What letter makes that sound? L. Okay. Say like. 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 Hit that last sound. Like. What'd you get? K. k. What letter makes the k, k sound? C. Well, you're right. C makes a k sound, but is there another letter that makes the k sound? K. There K. You go. K. Okay. Okay. Read in point. I like. Okay, now, let's just say that Michelle, let's try this again, and you start to write. So let's say she's further a little bit down the way. Uh, so go ahead, read and point. I like. Okay, I just started doing okay. Okay, now that's good. You got a couple of the sounds there. Let's try and get them all. Ready? Say like. Like. Let's get ready to come down your arm. Say like. Like. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, uh, I. Okay, so go ahead and put that I in. Say like and come down your arm. Say like. 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 Okay, so do you see what, what she's doing right there? She's taking a word and she's trying to hear each individual sound in it. That is segmenting phonemes, and that's what buys you all the great stuff in terms of reading achievement. That kind of task. Thank you, ma'am. I want to just put in a pitch quickly for making kids segment and isolate, not stretch. For a years, we've been doing this stretching bubblegum thing, me included, going like, like, like. Kids who are phonemically deficient, they, that's not helping them because they're not segmenting. They're just saying it louder and louder, like, like, but they're not segmenting, okay? So rather than stretching, have them segment. And in particular, coming down the arm seems to be extremely helpful for that in terms of segmenting, particularly medial sounds. Or you can tap fingers. Little kids, though, too, the fine motor skills are too tough. All right, let's finish up on phonological awareness. 
recommendations for it. When you're doing this kind of instruction, it's got to be oral. Kids got to say stuff. There's no such thing as a phonological awareness silent worksheet. Okay? Now, it should coincide with alphabet instruction and then word recognition instruction. Okay? Those things can all be worked on together. It's not like you do all phonological awareness, then alphabet, then learn to read. These are, if you're working at the early levels, um, phonological awareness should go all right along in tandem with your foundational level, your foundational skills, and then learning to read. Keep it brisk, keep it motivating, uh, make sure that every pupil is responding, strive for an 85% rec success record, and tell kids this helps us become better readers. All right, another one of the top predictors, alphabet knowledge. The main thing I want to stress about alphabet knowledge is this. There is a vast difference between the child who looks at a letter and says, M, and the child who looks at a letter and says, M. When you're talking about alphabet knowledge, you're talking about mastery, automaticity, and knowing the letter name and knowing the letter sound. Because the child who can't remember if this is M or N, is burning up a lot of cognitive capacity trying to remember that and let's not even talk about blending into the next letters okay so we're talking about all 26 upper and lower case plus their sounds they need to be over learned and that means accurate and fast uh, you can't learn to blend or chunk if you don't know what the letter is if you're stuck right here and then right here Blending the things together and coming up with a word is going to be very, very difficult and slow and painful. Why is it hard? We take it for granted because we've been messing with them for years and years, okay? Some of us more years than others. Well, it's because they have, letters have minimal and they're abstract features. If you think about it, all letters are is a few circles and lines arranged in different ways. They're not particularly, they don't stand out. And think about how confusable they are. G, P, B, D, Q. They, the only thing that's different is what side the stick's on of the circle, okay? Plus you got multiple fonts and hands. Look at this A. Doesn't look like a manuscript A, does it? But yet we expect kids to know these things. Learning letters and sounds requires time. So just plain time, attention, Kids got to pay attention. If you ever try to teach kid a kid le his letters, a three-year-old letters, and they're not interested, it's not happening. Practice takes a lot of practice, and the child has to be motivated. So the, think about it. The children who learn their letters at age two, age three, age four, and then walk in, and they're already overlearning fast, those children walk into first grade with a huge asset. The child who walks into first grade knowing four or five letters, sort of, is behind the eight ball already. So I really want to stress that notion of overlearned, accurate, and fast. And with this in mind, exposure like, this week is tea week, and that's it in kindergarten, does not cut it. Exposure. Think about the difference between time, attention, practice, and motivation, and exposure. Exposure is lovely for the kids that already know their letters. It's just a review. Okay? But it's not going to cut it for the child who doesn't know them at all because they are so confusable. They can memorize P or B, but then you throw P, B, Q, D at them, and all of a sudden they start saying P, B, D. Okay? So they, it requires a lot of time. I just want to remind you of something we do during early steps to work on this, okay? Oh, I know. Okay. So what I've identified here are two letters that Michelle knows really well, because we're reviewing, and one letter that she's still working on, okay? She's still working on N, okay? So, all right, flip one over. What is that? F. Sound? Let's put it over here. Keep going. K. Sound? So near here, I'm asking her for letter name and sound. Okay, put that over here. Um, N. 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 And whatever your keyword is. N. What is it in Wilson? N. I don't think. Let's just say nose. Watch me. N. Nose. N. Your turn. N. 
Okay, and put that over here. Okay, keep going. Okay. Match it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Keep going. F. Very good. And? Um, Some kids would say, you. Okay. N, nose, n. Your turn. N, nose, n. Okay, match it up. Okay, so sit, tell me letter name, letter name, and letter sound for each one. F, cake, n, n. Okay, and then just to just to put the icing on the cake, you play a quick game of memory, right? Okay. Oh, you got them. Take them. Great. Woo! -hoo. Woo -hoo. Party. Okay, keep, keep going. Oh, my turn. No, no, you got them. You got them. You get to go. Duh. Ooh. F. Uh, N. 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 Nose. N. Repeat. N. Nose. N. Okay, so you get the drift. Time. Practice. Attention, motivation, all geared toward overlearning letter name and sound. Okay, let's talk about the last of the top three predictors, print awareness. This is sort of, I think, the easiest one for kids to come to of the, th of the three, frankly. Print awareness is simply understanding, hey, those black squiggles on the page, they mean something. If you think about it, I mean, what's more interesting to a toddler, the picture or the black squiggles? In a heartbeat, it's the picture, but at some point they start recognizing that mom or dad or grandma or who, a teacher or whoever is doing something with the black squiggles under the page, particularly if the person who's reading tracks the print. Remember I talked about there's ways to read to kids and way, other ways to read the kids. A better way to read to the child is tracking the print along so that you can demonstrate things like that we go this way, front to back that we go left to right when we read, that we go from the top to the bottom, and that when we get to the end of this line, we do a return sweep. You know, if you think about it, that's a fairly arbitrary decision. Why don't we go like this when we read? But those are the conventions of print that need to be understood. Think about this simple direction. Turn to page 17 and put your finger on the first word. Let's just assume you can find page 17, but put your finger on the first word. If you don't have concept of word, you may think it means that letter. We take these kinds of things for granted. So there are all these different concepts. Um, which one is uppercase? Which one is lowercase? What's that dot at the end for? All those conventions of print that we take for granted need to be learned. And in particular, I would suggest that the most one of the most critical ones for actually learning to read is developing a concept of word, knowing that concept of word equals the most critic is most critical for, in other words, matching voice to print in a one-to-one -one correspondence. Knowing that it's reading development, not reading development. Kids tend to want to bounce with the syllables. Okay, they'd want to say reading. They've got to know reading. It's not concept, it's concept of word. That is, it's more difficult than it looks. And if you've ever worked with a child in early steps, levels one, two, or one and two, and trying to get to three, you'll see just how difficult it is. So how do we make this happen? There are all kinds of ways to do it. In particular, in early steps, you're going to see several, several uh, activities or instructional vehicles for this, this concept. One would be, uh, echo reading, where, and we're going to work on that in just a second, where the, where the uh, tutor points and reads and the child echoes or copycats. Also, if you remember, when you cut up the sentence, mix it all up, and the child has to put it back together, just rereading the sentence in the journal and having to point and read, point and read, point and read, 10 or 12 times during the sentence, that is all going to build that one-to-one voice-to-print match for concept of word. Pad a cake. Gotta use your finger though. Pad a cake. Pad a cake. Baker man. It looks like teeth. <laughs> Bake me a cake as fast as you 
can't get her legs sleeping. Pull it. And it. Pull it. And. Pat it. What's this say? Pull oh, it. That sounded out. Pat it. Mm -hmm. And. And pull it. Good. And mark it with, with a C. Mm -hmm. Then put it. Wait, what's, what's it say? That, and put it in into. Start right here. You'll make it'll be better. And and put it and put it in the. And put it, put and put and put it into the oven. Oven and for baby and me. Yes. Good. And put it. In the, the oven, oven for, for baby, baby and me. me. Try that again. And put it. And put it in the oven for baby and me. You want to think about, you know, why is this such a big deal? And I, in fact, for a long time, I remember, even when I was first learning early steps, I remember thinking, so what? Pointing, not pointing, sloppy pointing, who really cares? But when you, when you really work with struggling readers over a long ter period of time, you begin to realize why this ability is so critical and how it's really foundational in their learning to read. And if they don't get it, they struggle longer than they need to. And to, in order to sort of get back and look at this, you need to think about what's in the child's mind? What, what does the child see when they look at text? And if you're thinking about just a simple sentence like, can you find the camel in a little book, like a little predictable book that looks like this, can you find the cat, can you find the frog, I, know, I didn't do very good pointing there, can you find the frog, can you find the crab, can you find the fox, Okay, can you find the camel? Okay, so by now the child knows the drill. They know that it's going to be, can you find some kind of animal? So when they go back and read that book on their own, they're not really seeing this the way we do. Okay, they may as well be seeing a bunch of X's chunked into words, but that's okay for them. They can recite read it. They say, can you find the camel? And they can be in the right spot and match voice to print one to one very nicely simply by use of memory and pictures. Now, so why is this a big deal? Think about it. The child who knows where they are, when, they, when they're reading along the next day, and they say, can you find the, if they know where they are, and they can't remember what that big thing is, the camel, but they can look here and, 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 they, and they think, what's that sound? K -k. They look up at the picture and they remember, oh, camel. The child that knows where they are has a rudder to steer around that sea of text. If they don't know where they are, they can't even use that first sound. If they're just somewhere on the page, they can't even use that first sound. And so pointing and using the first sound to, to try to get the word, that's the most rudimentary of decoding strategies. And it sends the message, I need to look closely at the words, which is really critical and something some kids would prefer not to do. They want to look at you, they want to look at your forehead, they want to look at the air, they want to look at the picture, they want to look anywhere but at the word, and that's where they need to be looking. So, let's conclude on this one. We've got several things that all work together. Print awareness, alphabet knowledge, phonological awareness, word knowledge, meaning vocabulary, or no, meaning uh, high frequency words and decoding, oral language, these things all, and this is directly from Adams, they bootstrap on one another. That is, growth in one area stimulates growth in the other and vice versa. This relationship is known as, being, as reciprocal causality. In other words, it's not just you do one and then that doesn't, then you do the next one and it's not lockstep, it's not linear. 
All these things work together and enhance each other more than if you did them in a linear fashion. The research is very clear on this. And I think this is probably some of the best writing. If you ever have a chance to read this book, and I'll show it to you, it's still worth ordering. It's still worth having. You can see mine is a dog-eared copy. Marilyn Adams, 1990 book, beginning to read. It's a little bit dated in the phonological awareness levels. Definitely worth it. And I want to just close this seminar with a quote from her. She says, specifically, it is not clear how either letter recognition or phonemic segmentation skills could be acquired except through their instruction and exercise. In other words, where do you get, you know, how do you get to be phonologically aware? How do you learn alphabet letters, names, and sounds? Okay. Someone instructs you and you get exercise, you get practice in it. You don't just, you know, we don't spring from the womb knowing our letters and sounds, okay? What then do they tell us about reading readiness? One irrepressible interpretation is that the likelihood that a child will succeed in first grade depends most of all on how much she or he has already learned about reading before getting there. And this interpretation seems soberingly correct. In the end, the great value of research on pre-readers may lie in the clues it gives us toward determining what the less prepared pre-reader needs most to learn. And again, I think she makes this wonderful, compelling argument. For these children, we have not a classroom moment to waste. So kindergarten, preschool, we've got to hit it hard, particularly for the kids who don't come in with that wealth of background knowledge that we know helps. See you next time.